Well, hello. I'm Pastor Stephen Kays of the Memphis Raleigh Seventh Adventist Church. I'm glad you're with us. I pray you'll be blessed by the sermon today. I am videoing this on Thursday. St Tropical storm war is coming in, bearing down on Memphis. You're probably watching this on Sabbath. I just hope that you are safe and well. Our sermon today is called The One Other Concept, and let's have a word of prayer and begin. Father in heaven, I just ask uh, for the Memphis area that you would just protect it, this whole region, really our whole country from the storm and those who have been impacted by it in the south of us, uh, that you would just help them to be able to uh, just rebuild. But now we're looking about building up for a heavenly home. So send your Holy Spirit here in Jesus' name, amen. The one another concept is mentioned about 50 times in the New Testament. And Jesus told us, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So that's the bottom supporting uh, pillar here, this pillar for the one another concept. It comes right from Jesus. And he also mentioned it other times, too, in the, uh, in the book of John. Let's go to Romans. And we'll start with verse 17 and go to verse 19. And here's what Paul writes. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not eating and drinking. But what is it? What is the kingdom of God? He tells us that it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So we see that we are to have righteousness, peace, and joy in the kingdom of God. So how do we as a people stay united? That's a good question. We come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different educations, male, female issues, age differences in our church. So how do we stay united? How do we keep from fragmenting or dissolving as a people? So we want to stay together. We want to be united. Well, verse 19 tells us, this is the New Revised Standard Version. Let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. So we need to be pursuing it. It is an effort. It's something that we go for, that we work on, is to make peace. That doesn't mean that we don't hold to our doctrines or that we don't hold to our principles or morals. No, we talk things out, work things out. But by doing that, we're trying to make peace, trying to build bridges. And when we're building bridges, we're making peace, it's for the mutual upbuilding, the edification, to make people better, to be moving forward. So it's something that we have to pursue, to put effort in, to have peace and to have mutual upbuilding. They call it a win-win type of negotiation. Our situation, a lot of times it's win-lose, and uh, those aren't the best. So we're trying to do things where everyone wins. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes votes happen, and some people want it one way, some another way, and the majority wins. Hopefully that we are mature enough and Christian enough to realize, okay, it was a fair and free uh, process here. We had our say, did get our way. Okay, we'll just live with it. But that's part of upbuilding too, and that's part of being peacemaker, realizing you have to be a good winner and you have to be a good loser. The story is told about a woman, and she said, one day I went to see a fellow worker, and she was a, it was a Christian worker, and she says here, she was a dear Christian, but she was impulsive. And as we talked, you know, we were in a hallway. I said something that she didn't like, and she took me by the shoulders and pushed me over the doorstep, shutting the door in my face. Oh, she says, I walked home indignant. Right? As I was praying to the Lord and asking him to show me what to do, give me some light on how to handle this situation, uh, 
John 13.35 came to her mind, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And God said to her, Will you go to her house tomorrow and show her love for my sake? So the, she said, Lord, I'll do it. I agree, I'll do it. And she had to just put aside her natural inclination of dying, of not wanting to die to self. So she went. She prayed and talked. And the result of when she was that lady, there was unity and peace. They were able to work things out, and that division was healed. Then she said, Then I saw that Satan had tried to separate us and bring a spirit of bitterness so as to hinder our uniting in prayer. Praise God, the victory was a very real one through the working of the power of the Holy Spirit. We had union one with another. So what was she doing? She was pursuing peace. She was going there so mutually they both could learn something from this and have a friendship and to have a relationship that works. There's another one here. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25. This is from the Good News Bible. And so there was no division in the body but all his different parts have the same concern for one another. So Paul here is talking about the church being a body. Some an eye, some an ear, different parts. Some parts are weaker, some parts are stronger. But he says, even though we have these differences, different gifts, different skills, different talents, sometimes different theologies and philosophies that we need to work out, uh, cultural sometimes differences but Paul says that we should have concern for one another looking out for one another and really as a church that's I think one of the things that makes our church strong is that we do have a concern for our members that we want to work things out we want to have a church that's functioning well where people come they're feeling happy feeling cared for, feeling valued, that yes, this is a good place, a warm place, I'm respected. And that's part of the concern for one another. Now why do we have a concern for one another? Because we are our brother's keeper. Jesus taught us that. We need to be concerned for those around us. We need to be concerned how our actions, our words, our influence, how it's affecting other people as they're watching us, and people watch us, and we're watching other people too, so everybody's, and, and that's a good thing, because we can learn by watching, and of course we're all watch because we just have eyes and looking around, and we see how things are going on. So, we are our brother's keeper, and the law of love demands that we have a concern for our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. On a bridge of a British battleship, there is a sign that said, it said here, remember the next astern, or remember the boat behind you. It was intended to be a constant reminder to the captain as he issues his orders not to do anything that would likely throw the next vessel behind him in difficulties. So we as Christians would do well to make this our motto. There may be another, perhaps, following in our wake, following close behind us. When we came, became Christians, we were close to people who were maybe a little more spiritually mature than, than us, and, and so we were drawn to them and, and, and learning from them. So there were maybe people behind us, watching us, our attitudes, our thoughts, our actions. And we don't want to do anything that would make them go astray or to lose heart. So for us land lovers, what we would say is, if you're going to make a turn, use your, what, turn signal. Look in your blind spots and then make your turn. How many times have someone been going on the road right behind them and they just turn with no blinker? It's like, ah! So you do this, it, gets, it can get close and get very, very close, looking out and having concern uh, for one another. 
When Les and I came into the church, we, after a few years, went into self-supporting work. It was a very good experience for us. We learned a lot. And I learned some business skills. I was helping to run uh, the, uh, the print shop that they had. And then it went into a, a quick copy center in town. So it was good. But we were on stipend. And we were also taking classes, too. So we had two classes in the morning. And we would, after the classes, we'd go work. And they would give us housing and pay electricity and a stipend. And that was it, the food, the other bills, telephone, clothes, car repair was all on us. And one day Leslie said to me, you know what? We don't have money for our car insurance. You can't pay it. So we talked a while and she finally, you know, they have vans here, they have cars here at this uh, institute we were at. We just use theirs to go to town to shop. So one, Day, I just put a sign on the back of our car for sale and came on Sabbath and I forgot the sign was on the back of the car on the inside of the window. It was a, a station wagon and we drove to church and after church a man came up to me and said, Steve, why are you selling your car? And I think, oh, I didn't take it off. I, think, I didn't want to advertise it, didn't mean to. And I told him, I said, we're in self-supporting work, you know that. We're enjoying ourselves, but we can't afford our car insurance. He just looked at me and he says, I'll pay your next six months car insurance for you. And that was enough to carry us through. That having that concern for one another. Listen, I've always appreciated that kindness that this one had, that this man had for us. Him and his wife were very nice people. So just uh, having concern, looking out for people, helping them out. Keep your ears open for what's going on. Asking people, how are you doing? Everything okay? Anything you can, I can help you with? Showing concern and then helping them as you can. As you can. There was a time, it was after church. It was a story of Alame that I preached. Uh, he was a doorman at the church. Couldn't read, couldn't write. I tell you, he could greet. And after church, I walk out and nearly everybody's gone and he's just sitting by the door on a little area there. He said, what are you still doing here, Al? And he said, I need to get to uh, these people's homes for lunch. And I'm thinking, okay, that's about a 20 mile drive one way. Then back to my house, maybe about 25 miles. And why I was thinking that is because I lived close to the church and I didn't have much gas on Friday in my car, but I plan I had plenty to go to church and home and then just have a quiet afternoon. I didn't have enough to go all the way to that house, drop Al off and come home. So I said, you know what, Al hop in, I'll give you a ride. So I brought him there, dropped him off, turned around, went down a couple miles on the road and I bought just enough gas to get home. And it really felt weird buying gas on Sabbath. But I realized it was more Christ-like for me to bring Al to where he needed to go than to leave him there. So it's lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. So I wanted to show concern for Al. He was a great guy. And so sometimes it's about our comfort zone to help people. So being able to help Al was a real privilege. And I remember that to this day. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So when we see somebody saying something wrong, what's it say? Go, it was gentleness, go talk to them. Hey, can we sit down for a minute or two? Can we a little while? I have a, I have a concern, I'd like to talk to you coming very quietly, humbly, in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. And then here's the interesting point, building up to the spirit of gentleness and then also looking at ourselves, you know, I've done things too. And people have talked to me and have been uh, very nice and I've appreciated it. So it says here, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, bearing other people's burdens. And part of bearing other people's burdens is 
when you see that hmm, their burden may be they went back to drinking that happens I know a person who was baptized and they went back to smoking and that happens what do we do you try to redeem them you try to redeem them some of people there may be health problems it could be marriage problems children problems there's all kinds of problems it could be having a besetting habit and so what do we do we go and visit we talk we bear their burdens uh, if they're caught in a sin and there's a trespass then we help them to work their way out of it pray for them encourage them sometimes we have to bear them up sometimes you have to almost like you're you're holding them up to keep them from falling here's a poem it's called carrying brother the crossing was muddy the street was wide the water was running on either side. The wind whistled past with a bitter moan as I winded my weary way home, alone. And crossing the street, I chanced to pass a boy in the arms of a wee toddling girl. Isn't he heavy, my sweet little mother? Oh no, she replied, he's my baby brother. The load may be heavy, the road may be long, the winds of adversity bitter and strong, but the way will seem brighter if you love one another. The burden will be light if you carry a brother. So carrying a brother, helping them out, being there for them, sometimes taking them home for a meal after Sabbath, giving them a call during the week and talking to them, encouraging them, praying with them, Sometimes they need instruction. Some people just need instruction. Not everybody was brought up in, a, in a, a home where they were taught to do things. So we were in one place and a lady came to Leslie and said, you know, I really don't know how to keep house. Husband, two kids. And she said to Leslie, would you help me to, would you teach me how to, how to clean house and keep house? And she needed help. So another lady heard about this and she was a real whiz and she said, hey, Leslie, let me do this. I want to do this. So she went over and after several times taught this lady how to keep a house, how to clean it, how to put things away, make sure the trash is taken out, don't leave dirty dishes in the, in the sink for days on end, laundry, and, you know what? and it worked. It worked. So bearing other people's burdens, sometimes maybe some financial burdens or somebody may need a little help. You know, and that always helps like Wes and I did with our, with our car insurance. And maybe it's just a friend. Some people may just need a friend. So carrying a burden, loving one another, bearing one another's burdens. I mean, just 50 times in the New Testament. So the church caring for each other was a big deal. The New Testament church were meeting daily. They were happy in the temple. And it was a, a time of explosion uh, for the church. I've heard people say, why doesn't the Bible say more about family in the New Testament? Well, it did in the culture of the church. So the principles that the apostles wrote and Jesus taught about how the church members should be united, working together, loving one another, showing patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, encouragement, redeeming people who have fallen. That is the same principles we use in our homes. So it is there. It is there because the church is a family. We're the family of God. We're the children of God. The people in church are the brothers, our brothers and sisters. They're the sons and daughters of God. And God holds us accountable for how we deal with each other. So being willing to carry people's burdens, because someday the roles may be reversed and you may need someone to carry you. And because the church has been trained to look out for one another, to care for one another, to love one another as Christ has loved us, so your day may come when you have a downturn. And because the church is ready to go, then what are they going to do? They're going to lift you up. They're going to bear your burden. That burden would be like a load, something heavy, a weight, 
So people have a, just a load on their shoulders that we don't even know about. And uh, when we find out about it, just praying, caring for them, loving them. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Paul says here, with all humility and gentleness. With what? All humility and gentleness. So it's interesting, we see this again, uh, this gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So with humility, humility is power. Always remember that. Humility is not cowardness, right? Humility is just knowing your place and recognizing other people as being valuable. And it talks about gentleness. Gentleness opens doors. Patience, bearing or holding up one another in love. It says make every effort every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Now that, that doesn't mean every effort is to make decisions that would lead us away. It's every decision that would make us to be united. Jesus was that way with his disciples. They're walking down the road and he knows what's going on behind him. They're all jostling for the first place in the kingdom and they're upset with each other. Oh, what are you talking about? Oh, nothing. And my wife says, they're arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. So Jesus was bearing along with those men. And in the end, it came out. Paul, with the churches he planted, you read Corinthians, they had significant problems. But what did Paul do? He worked them, he wrote to them, he encouraged them, he rebuked them, he taught them, showed them the right way. So uh, doing that, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And it says in the bond of peace, there's a bond, there is a, a strength connection, a strong connection when there's peace between people. It's very good to have that. A story about a pastor. He went to visit a poor mother on a mountain farm. And when he got there, knocked on the door, shut the door, and she said, oh, somehow I felt just as if you would come today. I have so many troubles and problems that I want you to help me, help me out with them. Then she started telling him things that brought tears to his eyes. And he's sitting there, and she's just telling all these things, thinking, she must think I'm just such a, a dunce, a fool. I don't even know how to even answer these things. I don't even know how to help her just sitting there, just pained. And all of a sudden she says, oh, you have, you have just helped me out so much. You, this is exactly what I needed. Thank you. And then he got up and left. And then he realized, hmm, she didn't need wisdom. She needed sympathy, just a listening ear, just for her to vocalize these things, probably clear them up. And so he didn't proceed to solve a problem. Uh, but he did solve a problem just by sympathy, a listening ear, just having that mutual, um, maintaining that unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, talking to this lady was powerful. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 to 32 here. Paul again writes, a lot of these come from Paul. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. So we're saying these things don't make for unity. Don't hold grudges or bitterness against each other. Don't do it. Matthew 18 tells us how to settle those issues when it gets to that level. Is you go talk to that person and say, hey, there's a problem. Can we meet and let's talk it out? We try to talk it out. And honestly, that's really where Jesus wants that to be settled right there. He gave the other staff bring two or three with you when it can't be. But that is really what God, Jesus wanted, is that two human beings could sit down and work out something that they could fix the problem. But when it can't, then you bring two with you, 
If that two or three with you, then that doesn't work, then you take it to the church. So what he says, he let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, arguing, fighting, and slander, people saying rude and mean things about each other. He says, put that away from you. That's the old man. Take off the old man. Put, put that away, okay? Put that away from you. Then he says, along with malice. Oh, there can be some really deep fighting can happen in churches if we're not careful. So don't do this. And then he says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted. So now he's showing the true traits is that we should be kind. We should be thoughtful. We should be gentle with people, doing good things for them. Be kind to one another. That's part of that one another concept. Tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So as you want Christ to deal with you, deal with other people. This be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. That is in every one of my wedding sermons that I give. I build that in there somewhere that that is such a, a, a bedrock for a strong relationship is kindness. Be kind to one another, just kind, tender-hearted towards each other, forgiving each other, whether it's in a marriage, home, business, extended family, or church. Having a forgiving spirit goes a long way just telling people, you know what? Well, two things. One, if we've done wrong, we go ask for forgiveness. You know what, the other night in that meeting, I said something harsh I shouldn't have said, I'm sorry, and I'm gonna make it right and tell everybody I misspoke or what I did was wrong, but I wanna, I wanna ask you to forgive me. That's powerful, that's powerful. And what if the second thing that's powerful is, I forgive you, and then you let it go. Make sure that whatever, circumstances brought that along, that you handled it better, so it's not brought back there, that you, that, that, that you stop that from happening again. And uh, we're forgiving each other, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. There's another a number of young women students who needed to find a part-time job they were going to the Moody Bible School, Bible Institute. So what would they do? They placed their names on applications for positions in some of the large businesses in Chicago. One day, the head of one business contacted the institute saying, hey, we have an opening for one woman, and it's $200 a week. So the lady who was in that office arranging where the girls would work, she called the one first on the list and said, hey, we have a job, it's $200 a week. And the girl stopped for a minute. And she said, what about Miss Brown? Is her name on the, up on the list too? Well, Miss Brown's name's on the list. Matter of fact, she's number two on the list. Um, if I leave and take that job, because I'm making $150 a week now, that's a $50 raise, could she do my job? Because her job doesn't pay as much as mine. And the lady said, no, she couldn't do your job. Hmm. So this young girl said, I want Miss Brown to take the job. I'm willing to keep my job. And they said, you're, you're on the list. You're for number one. Just take the job. And she said, I can't take the job. I don't want that job. I'll stay for my 150 a week and let Miss Brown have the $200 a week job. So what was she doing, being kind, tender-hearted? She knew that girl needed it bad. And she was willing to stay where she was because she was making what she, what she could or what she needed for school. We're to be kind and tender-hearted to each other. How can we be kind and tender-hearted? By walking in love, just as Jesus walked. Jesus desires us to forgive each other as his Father has forgiven us. We have a diversity among us as a people. But we should have a unity also, unity with love and compassion for one another. 
So be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. That's our prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you've called us into your church. And all of us are your children. So help us be kind to each other, bearing with each other, supporting, encouraging, forgiving, moving forward, closer to your kingdom day by day, and to rightly represent you on this earth, because all the world will know that we are your disciples if we have love one for another. In Jesus' name, amen.